New York, September 2014. 300,000 people march to protect the climate. Their objective is to prompt 200 countries to take action against global warming under the auspices of the UN. To date, no agreement has been reached. The result of a certain diplomatic inertia, but also of a movement that has cast doubt over the reality of the issue. Climate change skepticism. Is the movement powerful enough to cause a breakdown in negotiations? What weapons does it have at its disposal to wage the climate war? Since the year 2000, our planet has beaten all temperature records. The last decade was the hottest both hemispheres had ever experienced. In the last 15 years, greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere have reached unprecedented levels. It's a result of the constant rise in human activity. The science is settled, global warming is well and truly underway, and its consequences are dramatic. Since 1980, the Arctic ice pack has lost 40% of its surface area. The glaciers of Antarctica are melting at an accelerated rate. As a direct consequence, average sea level has risen two times more than last century. Everywhere, extreme climatic phenomena are on the rise. Storms, droughts, tornadoes, hurricanes. An average of 700 catastrophes strike our planet every year. Faced with the extent of these phenomena, the international community is now coming together. In 1988, climatologists and UN diplomats created the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Thousands meet every year to compare their data. Their role is to assess and inform on the risks of global warming caused by man. In this capacity, in 2007, IPCC scientists received the most prestigious of prizes. The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided that the Nobel Peace Prize for 2007 is to be shared in two equal parts between the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, and Albert Arnold L. Gore, Jr., for their efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change. For the scientific community, there was no denying the facts, and more generally, there was a real consensus. But it was not to last. Ces théories sont une imposture, et je pense que ces scientifiques ne sont pas corrects. Alors ce réchauffement, il serait, il serait lié à quoi Mais à, 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 à... le réchauffement, quel réchauffement Vous avez vu un réchauffement Il fait de plus en plus froid. Moi, je pense qu'on ne. Vous avez qu'à le voir. Je pense qu'on ne peut comprendre. pas prévoir le climat, pas plus qu'on peut prévoir le temps à plus de cinq jours de distance. Vous avez qu'à regarder la météo, puis c'est tout. On prévoit le temps à deux ou trois jours. Prévoir le climat dans un siècle, c'est une imposture. Claude Allègre. In 2010, the former French Minister for Higher Education and Research published a book that sold more than 120,000 copies, L'Imposture Climatique, meaning The Climate Lie. With his book, Allègre, who was also a geophysician, caused shockwaves in the media. The French learned a new term, climate change skepticism. It refers to those who do not believe in global warming, but also to those who think that if global warming does exist, it cannot be a result of human actions. Without being an expert, Claude Allegra became the guest in debates on the climate. His favorite opponent was the IPCC and its experts. As in this French TV show aired in 2010, L'Objet du Scandale, The Object of Scandal. 
Opposite the former minister, IPCC member Valérie masson delmotte a paleoclimatologist. The woman challenging the former minister has traveled to the coldest areas of our planet. She has taken numerous ice samples in Greenland and Tibet in order to reconstitute climate history. Her work helps improve models of climate evolution to make them as accurate as possible. Opposite TV celebrity Claude Allegre, the climatologist puts up a good fight. Quand on parle du climat, il faut regarder à grande échelle. Et d'ailleurs, vous-même, vous faites des moyennes. Vous présentez, par exemple, une courbe de température moyenne à Paris. Et, et, et cette courbe est fausse. Je, je suis en train de faire un Mais papier. Vous, vous présentez une courbe de température non, où il fait 8 degrés fais... en moyenne non, à je... Paris. Il fait non, 12 non, en non, moyenne. Non, cette je courbe ne... est oui. fausse. Mais j'étais temps que vous vous rencontriez tous les deux. <rire> Il est invité dans cette émission de présenter comme un spécialiste, alors qu'en réalité, il ne, il ne connaît pas, euh, il ne lit pas les articles scientifiques de notre domaine. Et c'est peut-être ce qui est le plus frustrant. C'est-à-dire que Claude Allègre, il a la chance pour moi d'incarner l'image du scientifique pour le grand public. Et je pense que cette chance-là, c'est-à-dire d'être une sorte de, de figure emblématique, euh, ça s'accompagne d'un minimum de devoirs. En ayant une parole de spécialiste, d'avoir une parole de spécialiste informée. J'espère que les téléspectateurs, ils entendent oui, que non, Claude Allègre, il a des avis que je partage non. sur certains points, mais sur d'autres points, il dit des non, choses non. énormes Madame, qui Madame, ce n'est pas vrai. J'ai vraiment une grande frustration par rapport à Claude Allègre et certains climato-sceptiques, parce que je pense qu'ils nous ont volé la possibilité d'avoir sur la place publique un débat scientifique rationnel, sérieux. Dans le débat avec Claude Allègre, j'avais quand même un peu l'impression d'être en dehors de mon écosystème normal, c'est-à-dire d'être dans une espèce de, de divertissement qui cherchait un peu à faire du scandale aussi. Vous pouvez travailler tant que vous voulez euh, sur ce problème, vous n'êtes pas capable aujourd'hui de modéliser le climat. Moi, je, je ne fais pas de prédiction, je n'y crois pas aux prédictions. Alors moi, c'est ce qui me frappe dans les propos d'Allègre, quand il dit, par exemple, je ne crois pas aux capacités à prévoir ou à anticiper. Donc il exprime, il exprime une croyance. Et dans mon travail quotidien de chercheur, euh, je ne pense pas que mon travail relève de la croyance. C'est-à-dire que s'il y a une hypothèse, on va essayer de la tester, de la confirmer, de l'infirmer, euh, mais ça ne relève pas de la croyance. Science versus beliefs or a crude media conquest. The scientists' arguments were convincing, but so were Claude Allegra's panache. For the television viewers, the scientific consensus had just been shattered. A climate war was unfolding right on their screens. Claude Allegra and the climate change skeptics were wrong, but in the name of debate, their doubts on global warming became an opinion. And as all opinions are equal, the audience forged their own. A 2013 survey revealed that 13% of French people did not believe in global warming. 22% did not believe that global warming was a result of human activity. So one French person in three claimed they were climate change skeptic. The scientific facts had been proven, so how was doubt able to spread so rapidly? C'est devenu un sujet clivant, un sujet lié aux opinions politiques, alors que pour moi, les sciences du climat, c'est un, un domaine scientifique. Et là, on voit que le, je dirais, un certain nombre de lobbies climato-sceptiques ou autres hein, enfin, ont eu vraiment un succès énorme. Je pense qu'il y a des différences énormes d'un pays à l'autre et que le meilleur exemple, c'est pas la France. Pour des raisons Claude Allegro a retiré de la vie publique en 2013. His absence considerably weakened the climate skeptic movement in France, and nobody has picked up where he left off. But elsewhere, veritable climate change denial professionals are acting openly to sabotage climate policies. Warsaw. In 2013, the Polish capital hosted the 19th United Nations Climate Change Conference. It is the major annual climate negotiations event. Nearly 200 countries came together in a bid to reduce their greenhouse gases. But agreeing is not easy. The wealthy countries struggle to change their lifestyle. The emerging countries want to take advantage of growth. 
and the most vulnerable countries request money to adapt to climate change. The lack of progress over the last 20 years is also due to the companies that have built their fortunes selling gas, petrol and coal. The fossil fuels precisely responsible for global warming. Ecologists are trying to alert public opinion but struggle to make themselves heard. The climate change denial warriors carry out their work within this delicate diplomatic context. CFACT, an openly climate change skeptic organization, has come to make trouble. It has organized a press conference. Its communications director, Mark Morano, sets the hostilities in motion. If you look at floods, which are part of extreme weather, up to 100, uh, 115 or 125 years of no trends in the peer-reviewed literature. If you look at droughts, the last 60 years have been a decline in U.S. drought and no trend globally, slight decline globally. If you look at tornadoes, F3 and larger tornadoes have been on the decline in the U.S. In fact, this year, uh, this is still going to be a record low year for tornadoes in the United States. We have now reached the idea we can somehow control these weather events through cap and trade, through carbon taxes, through UN treaties. This is now the level of medieval witchcraft, sadly. And this is supposedly the modern age. Can we take another question, please? I think my question would probably just be, how do you sleep at night? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how you sleep at night. I'd just like to add, I sleep very well. I hear you're concerned. But I would like to also say one of the things we're concerned about is that these climate policies, in fact, do harm people. You, know, you look around the world, those areas with the cheapest, most abundant energy generally rely on coal. Decarbonization, uh, that's having a devastating effect on poor people around the globe. So we sleep well at night, and uh, we believe that our policies will actually help, not hurt people. In this temple of climate negotiations, CFAC's discourse had the effect of a bombshell. The face-to-face -face was brutal. The American climate change skeptics on the one hand, and on the other, the audience that was convinced that global warming was a reality, really had nothing in common. But that was not a problem for CFACT, because its activists were not aiming so much to convince as to take advantage of the showcase. Their stand was right next to that of the ecologist NGOs. One of CFAC's co-founders, Craig Rucker, explains their strategy. We are coming here because although we know that many people here at this particular conference, the people who are gathering here would agree with the UN, but we feel it's still important to come here and show why many of us don't agree with our perspective. Behind a theoretically scientific argument, these global warming deniers affirm their convictions. There has been no global warming for 17 years and little change in drought for 60 years. Polar bears are doing just great. On this stand, each claim is born out of belief and takes the exact opposite stance to science. It seems like if you are like non-religious people in the middle of Vatican. <laughs> that is well put. Uh, yes, we're definitely people that would be viewed by the attendees here as uh, apostates, no question. Uh, but from our perspective, we feel that we, um, I guess you could, using religion again, that we're missionaries uh, trying to reach lost souls. There are many people in the uh, COP who have not formulated their opinion or only are vaguely familiar with the questions of climate science. So it is to them we are trying to reach. We understand we're not going to hit all the true believers. But if we can make an impact, and we think we have, uh, we'll continue to do this. Craig Rucker is feigning modesty. He and his team are veritable denial professionals. And so efficient are they at their job, they have managed to make considerable impact in the U.S. Indeed, one American in two is now a climate change skeptic. And 75% of conservatives are. Who are these climate naysayers, and what is their strategy? We head for the U.S. to try and track down the most vociferous climate skeptics. Las Vegas, a symbol of the American way of life. 
It takes no less than eight average sized nuclear reactors to supply this city in electricity. With this way of life, which President Bush affirmed was not negotiable, one American emits nearly 18 tons of CO2 a year. That's nearly three times more than the average French citizen and 23 times more than a citizen of Somali. This hotel and casino is a venue of the world's largest gathering of climate change skeptics. Once again, we meet Craig Rucker, executive director of CFACT. With him, 600 supporters from Europe, Australia and India, rallying around one idea. Climate change is bogus. In their crusade against those they refer to as warmists, the skeptics use all weapons at their disposal. The first of them is a defense of their personal freedom. You have green advocates wanting to regulate your thermostats in your house. We have laws like that in California. They want to, in some cases, uh, regulate your air travel. Uh, they want to be able to uh, have a hand in where you get your electricity from. Um, and that those sorts of things are infringements on personal freedom. Uh, in some cases in this country and elsewhere, they actually want to regulate how long you can idle your car. All right, these are infringements on personal freedom. The entire CFAC staff has made the journey. Here, Mark Morano is a veritable star and is in great demand. He's the movement's poster boy and is given red carpet treatment. Who is Mark Morano? They even call him the Godfather. For him, being skeptical is a matter of course, especially when it comes to the environment. One of the first things that makes a, uh, many on the global warming skeptic side suspicious is the solutions. And oddly enough, regardless of the eco scare, whether it's global cooling, deforestation, overpopulation, the solutions always seem to be the same, even if they're decades apart. More central planning, more government intervention in our lives. So people tend to be very skeptical every time an environmental concern comes along. Good evening, fellow evil climate change deniers. <laughs> We are actually fighting a war here. It is a war for Western civilization, a war for freedom. What we're seeing going on now, being conducted by the environmental movement, is a war on capitalism, a war on freedom, a war on our way of life. James Dellingpole is a columnist on the conservative British paper, The Daily Telegraph. His arguments on the defense of freedom hide a libertarian ideology, an ultra-liberal philosophy that extols non-interventionism of the state. Nothing should be regulated, not the economy, nor human activity. And I'm a great believer in, in liberty. Uh, for me, what got me interested in the whole climate change debate is that I see the issue of global warming being used as an excuse to justify the expansion of government in the form of higher taxation, in the form of greater regulation. Um, and what I see also is tremendous damage being done in the name of saving the planet. The Green Movement is ultimately misanthropic, doesn't like mankind. If you look at the, the Green literature, you find phrases like, the Earth has a cancer, or the cancer is man. Ultimately, the Green Movement is uh, it's an assault on Western civilization. I've written a whole book about this called Watermelons. Green on the outside, red on the inside. In his book, James Dellingpole revisits an old expression, watermelons. From the late 1980s, watermelons were used to designate ecologists. At the time, communist ideologies were floundering and ecology exploded into the political arena. For their opponents, the ecologists' agenda was to advance socialist or collectivist ideas under the cover of environmental protection. 
According to James Dellingpole, that would make the young man here on the left a watermelon. Connor Gibson is a Greenpeace activist. Dressed in a dark suit, he is trying to blend in. He knows the movement inside out. You can't exactly act like this is a populist movement when it seems to be the type of people that are lawyers and lobbyists and well-paid, comfortable um, folks whose, whose political careers don't necessarily rely on honesty. I think it is very telling that you're not seeing young people here, that you're not seeing very many women here, that you're not seeing very many people of color here. Um, this isn't a grassroots conference. A lot of the people here use words like freedom, liberty, prosperity, patriotism uh, to, to get the American public on their side. They're powerful words, but they're misrepresenting what they're actually doing. In the U.S., the climate debate quickly shifted to a strictly political terrain. The global warming deniers first came to Las Vegas to galvanize their troops and strengthen their networks. They need all the reinforcement they can get, especially at the highest level of the state. Dana Rohrabacher is a conservative and a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. This Californian politician with a passion for surfing and the ocean recounts an anecdote that speaks volumes about his ecological commitment. One of my heroes has always been Jacques Cousteau. And I was assigned to cover a speech by Jacques Cousteau at UCLA. It was really, really pessimistic. Jacques Cousteau was saying that the oceans are dying. I said, uh, uh, Mr. Cousteau, aren't there some positive signs as well? And he looked at me and he came right up to my face, right up to my face. And he goes, didn't you hear me? In 10 years, the oceans will be dead, absolutely dead, black goo. <laughs> well, I want you to know that about six months ago, I was sitting out in my surfboard and there's all kinds of pelicans and birds and all kinds of fish jumping over. And I'm thinking, black goo? Like, now, I'm going to say something here is really, really bad. No, the oceans are alive. Jacques Cousteau died years ago, and now he is black goo. <laughs> In Congress, Dana Rohrabacher fights to block all laws, constraints, or rules that would require a reduction in U.S. CO2 emissions. But the movement's real political hero comes from Oklahoma. He has an even more influential position of office, Senator. One of the leaders in this fight is Senator James Inhofe in D.C. Back in the beginning, right after the Kyoto Treaty, they tried to ratify that in the Clinton Court. Well, uh, I was all alone at that time, and they started introducing bills for cap and trade. And we went through seven different ones in the following 10 years, and we defeated them all, each one by a larger margin. Now, I say this because right now, the, the, the alarmists are losing this race. We're right, they're wrong, and we have won. James Inhofe is right. Since 1997, no federal laws to fight global warming have been voted in the U.S. Things have evolved under Barack Obama. In 2014, the U.S. and China even committed to taking action to limit their CO2 emissions. But James Inhofe remains vigilant. He is a die-hard skeptic. Today, he is chairman of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee and has written a book with the eloquent title, The Greatest Hoax, How the Global Warming Conspiracy Threatens Your Future. We attempted to set up a meeting with him, but he did not wish to respond which comes as no surprise to Mark Morano, who was formerly his communications director. You're French, so that, frankly, a lot of conservatives don't trust the French and French media and all that. They like your nuclear policies, but that's about it. In fact, Inhofe made a career of mocking your former uh, Jacques, uh, um, uh, Jacques Chirac, um, because he called him the old socialist, and he was the one that called for the first component of an authentic global governance, Kyoto. Uh, and so, after September 11th, we called them freedom fries, not French fries. So my point being is that there's a distrust of the French, French media. There's a distrust of a documentary. There's a distrust of being pre-recorded. Uh, and there's a, it's a, you're, you're like every X possible, every block in the way there. 
To better understand what fertile ground James Inhofe's skeptic ideas have been propagating in, a brief trip is in order to the state he represents, Oklahoma. Oil, shale gas, natural gas, and coal. The subsoil of this Midwest state is bursting with fossil fuels. More than 125,000 wells supply 200,000 barrels a day. One inhabitant in five makes a living from the industry. Inhofe embodies Oklahoma at a federal level, but Lee Denny lives and breathes the reality of the state on a daily basis. This local representative of a small town of 10,000 inhabitants is very close to Inhofe, and she defends tooth and nail what constitutes the wealth of her state. The largest population in Oklahoma agrees with Senator Inhofe. We like the oil and gas industry because it's been good to our state. Uh, many people work for the oil and gas industry, so it provides a livelihood. Um, we believe that the government should stay out of our business, and we believe in low taxes. Uh, we believe that uh, our business is our business, and we should be re take responsibility for ourselves and not take government handouts. That's what it means to be conservative. I do support the oil and gas industry, I, 100%. Uh, it's very important in this part of the country. But um, I, I haven't been convinced of global warming. For Lee Denny, global warming or not, what counts is this expansive landscape. Her town, Cushing, is home to about 100 vast oil reserves. They alone supply 50% of the annual petrol consumption of all American cars. Cushing is a crossroads for the largest pipelines in the U.S. We set out to meet the Oklahoma oil companies with one question in mind. If you make a living from fossil fuel, what do you think of global warming? A meeting was set up with Continental Resources. But when we arrived, bad news. I'm sorry. I mean, I appreciate you coming here, but... I, and what's the reason why you can't do that? Right, I, I'm just telling you it won't it's, work. It won't work, yeah. okay. So I appreciate, I, I'm telling you, we would love to be accommodating, but it just won't work. Okay, okay, so, we'll go right. on like this. Okay. That's not On the climate issue, a highly sensitive one for their interests, the oil companies are careful to remain discreet. But in Oklahoma, others are quick to make their voices heard and to fight these all-powerful industries. One woman embodies this combat, Casey Camp. The idea of freedom is far removed from that of the libertarians. I would ask, how does one def define freedom? Would you walk into your friend's house and, uh, and poop on their floor and say, now you sit in that because I'm free to do that to you as well? We don't have the freedom to choose for other human beings that we of the industrialized nations, the United States and China and Europe, could choose to defile the earth to the point that our, our friends and relatives in the underdeveloped countries have to drown on the islands because of the rising seas or have no air to breathe or the drought has created where they can't grow food. We don't have that freedom. Casey Camp is one of the most respected figures of the Ponca tribe. For her, her people are the victims of constant pollution by the white man. She takes us to the land of her ancestors. When the Poncas were forcibly removed in 1877, we had 101,000 acres 
They have a coal fire generating plant down here put on their land. And it is uh, uncovered coal, which blows coal dust over their uh, community all the time. It was about 15 homes there up until 10 years ago. And those homes, every single home had people dying of cancer. I don't know if you can see the trees, how dark they are here. You can see the black that is on my fingers. That's black carbon. The link between pollution and cancer is hard to prove. But the Ponca tribe are pursuing their case for poisoning against the fuel industry. We are getting no gratification in our federal court, so maybe through the United Nations there may be some recourse. If my people are being killed, literally killed, murdered, by the environmental practices of places like this in ConocoPhillips, isn't that a human rights violation? They have no choice but to deny any climate change or any problem that the carbon industry is creating in Oklahoma, or they lose their job, and their job's important to them. It's, it's all about money. In Oklahoma, the fossil fuel industry generates up to $28 billion a year. In the face of such financial manna, what weight do past or future victims carry? The federal courts threw out the tribe's case to be inadmissible. With its financial clout, the fossil fuel industry can afford the services of powerful allies. Which begs the question, did the senator of Oklahoma, James Inhofe, benefit from the fossil fuel industry's largesse to fund his electoral campaigns? Mark Morano, his former director of communications, sheds light on the matter. He's from Oklahoma. It's an oil gas state. That's literally all it is. That's who he represents. Uh, so that's not surprising that they would give him uh, donations, especially on that. Inhofe's answer, where they said, how much money do you get? He'd always say, not enough, when you look at how much money. Not enough, of course. But how much exactly? In the US, companies can sign very large checks to support their candidates. This influence of money on politics poses a major risk to American democracy. It is also why NGOs specializing in monitoring U.S. institutions have started to spring up. One such NGO, Open Secrets, has set up its offices just a stone's throw from the Capitol. The organization scrutinizes the flow of money to American politicians. Sarah Briner, an investigator with Open Secrets, interprets the donations Senator James Inhofe received. Donations that are subject to strict regulations with ceilings fixed by law. Here we have James Inhofe's career profile. So this is all of the money he's received since 1989, um, $19 million. You can see here the top five contributors to his campaign. The number one donor to him over his career has been Coke Industries, which is in the natural resources oil and gas sector, and then Murray Energy, which is also in that sector. You can also see that over the course of his time in the Senate, he's received $1.6 million from the oil and gas industry. Um, so that, that is a lot. That's his number one. It's a lot, and it also explains a lot. Supported by the fossil fuel industry, it is only logical that James Inhofe should block all laws that restrict for the sector and all laws in favor of the climate. But that's not all. Sarah Briner explains that industrialists are generous in very discreet ways. However, sort of funders of Coke Industries are known for supporting political activity via a network of nonprofits. So that money is actually uh, considered dark money, so it's difficult to track. But we've been able to sort of identify some of it and have worked with other news outlets to determine that they've contributed around $300 million, money which would never be disclosed to the Federal Election Commission. Co 
Talc industry is a veritable empire in the United States. At its head, two brothers, Charles and David, millionaires who made their fortune in the chemistry of oil. With $105 billion between them, they are wealthier than Bill Gates or George Soros. They use their money to finance the Tea Party, the right wing of the Republican Party, and they dream of toppling Barack Obama. But who really are the Koch brothers? For the last five years in San Francisco, an association has been investigating the two millionaires in minute detail. The reference point for them, I think, is the Dallas TV character, JR. When I was watching this character, it was while you know studying some of this Coke stuff, it's like, oh my God, this is, you know, Charles and David are like the, the brothers, but like on steroids. Joking aside, Victor Minotti is fully aware of the Coke brothers' power. We're trying to have influences by exposing that unique role that Coke is playing at this moment in, in history when the planet is, is literally burning up. The climate denialist movement in the US is pretty much, yeah, funded by, by the Koch brothers. Now, it's not only the money that they might give through foundations or academic institutions or whatever to some of the organizations that supports these denialists, um, but it's also the talking points that they provide them. It's the association with elected officials who then use those talking points in any scientific debate. Um, it's many different ways that they're able to, to be effective. The association has shed light on a veritable tentacular structure, the coctopus. This is um, a mapping we have of their influence network, all the different things that we can figure out what they give money to, and then of course the congressional collaborators, because that's where actually the rules are rigged in their favor of their pro-carbon agenda. Um, but it's the campaign contributions to these like-minded uh, people that, that run for office. And you can enter the name of any polluter, any politician, and see who gets money. And you can see Senator Inhofe is uh, among the biggest beneficiaries of those contributions as well. So it's, it's officialized corruption is what we have here. The tentacles of the coctopus have penetrated public life at various levels. The summit of the state with Dan Rohrabacher and above all, James Inhofe. Pressure groups such as the Heartland Institute, which organized the Las Vegas conference and field associations such as those of Craig Rucker and Mark Morano. But the octopus has also infiltrated science. Hey, yeah, come this way, I'll meet you. This, the front door will be right on, on your right. Richard Muller, a professor of physics from the University of Berkeley in the San Francisco Bay Area. In 2010, he was a member of the climate change skeptics family and he started researching the issue. I wanted to find out whether global warming was real, whether it was wrong, whether I should believe in it or not. At that time, it was a big debate. So there were skeptics on one side, there were true believers on the other side, they were always arguing. I just wanted to find out what the truth was. I had no reason to do anything other than act as a scientist. In order to verify his skeptic theory, he applied for funding, and the foundation of one of the Koch brothers wrote him a check for $150,000. After two years, we had all the data together, and I still remember that evening when I was looking through the data, and I said, well, it doesn't look, it's not volcanoes, that, that doesn't look very good, and uh, the solar variability, that really doesn't account for it, and oh my God, the carbon dioxide and the warming are a perfect match. That was an aha moment. At that point, suddenly, I was convinced, one, that global warming was real because we could see it in our data. We, we took care of all these issues. 
two, I knew the carbon dioxide increase was due to humans. That is clear. And here was the global warming matching the carbon dioxide. The irony of the story is that the Koch's money actually served to reverse a climate change skeptic. Richard Muller is very unlikely to be the only scientist to have fallen into the trap of skepticism. Yet the Koch brothers do their utmost to rally science to their cause by funding nearly one campus in three. Riley Dunlap is a sociologist at the University of Oklahoma. He lives in Senator Inhofe State and is aware of skeptic octopus ramifications. You will find some people who had academic careers, but very non-distinguished careers, marginal, but they, and they don't really have strong backgrounds at all in climate science, but they use their PhDs to take positions and they become very active in the blogosphere and sometimes they post things and so forth and they become viewed as quote experts and the blogosphere turns these people into uh, almost heroes. These climate change deniers meet with a certain level of success both on internet and in traditional media. One of the things that helps the climate change denial movement so much is what we call the conservative echo chamber. This huge media complex, sorry, Fox News, all the Rupert Murdoch papers, the Wall Street Journal, other papers, and especially right-wing talk radio. When current reality fails to alarm, make a bunch of scary predictions of the future. And that's what they've done. And of course, the only way to save us from that dark future are climate policies, EPA regulations, and next year, a UN treaty in Paris, which, President, uh, which Secretary of State John Kerry is pushing for. We're in our ninth year of a cooling spell. And everyone understands that that's the case. But it's driving them crazy. You think about the years that the people have put into this thing just hoping they would be right. One of the skeptic octopus tentacles reaches into the climate skeptic friendly media. I'm here for the International Conference on Climate Change. They chose the right city for it. It sounds government ish, but it's actually a group of skeptics, real independent scientists, not government propagandists. Ezra Levent is the star presenter of Sun News, the Canadian equivalent of Fox News. I have my own opinions. I'm not a scientific expert, but I try to talk to scientists uh, and other researchers and other activists. Uh, I talk to people on uh, across the whole spectrum, but my own sympathies are clear. I'm a skeptic of the theory of man-made global warming. In true good skeptic soldier style, the journalist pursues his crusade. Media coverage of global warming is so uniform and uh, it, it's almost like it's a state-run media under the former Soviet Union. There's an official line and anyone who deviates from it is marginalized uh, either informally or officially. Ezra Levent is a member of a highly efficient cell. The octopus acts simultaneously on several levels. Still today, it contributes to blocking U.S. climate policy and, by extension, influences climate policy worldwide. New York, September 2014. An historic People's Climate March brought nearly 300,000 people out onto the streets of Manhattan. The objective of the demonstration was to put pressure on leaders all over the world to find an agreement, and fast. Among the crowd were high-flying personalities former U.S. Vice President Al Gore, and U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Alongside them, French ministers Ségolène Royal and Laurent Fabius. 
Vous croyez que ça va changer quelque chose Ça marche. contribue, euh, parce que ça a lieu dans beaucoup de pays du monde, et ça veut dire que la société civile prend conscience de ce qui existe et va nous pousser, nos gouvernements, à agir dans le bon sens. Donc je crois que c'est un élément assez fort, oui. The French will host the forthcoming UN Climate Change Conference in Paris in 2015. For them, failure is simply not an option. The French Minister of Foreign Affairs dismisses the threat posed by the skeptics. Il y a de moins en moins de climato-sceptiques parce qu'on se rend bien compte que notamment tous, tous les phénomènes extrêmes sont beaucoup plus graves aujourd'hui que c'était le cas il y a 20 ou 30 ans. Mais euh, il y en a encore des climato-sceptiques, et notamment aux États-Unis. Mais en France, c'est de moins en moins vrai. En revanche, il ne faut pas remplacer le climato-scepticisme par le climato-fatalisme. Parce qu'il y a des gens qui disent « oui, le problème existe, mais c'est uniquement dans 50 ans et de toutes les manières, on ne peut rien y faire ». C'est pas vrai. Ça commence dès maintenant et on peut agir. The French delegation has pulled out all the stops for the negotiations. President Hollande has come to New York surrounded by his ministers and his special envoy for the protection of the planet. Le Pentagone lui-même à plusieurs reprises a indiqué dans différents rapports que les changements climatiques pesaient sur la sécurité intérieure autant que la menace terroriste. Plus personne ne conteste qu'il y a là une, 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 une arme de destruction massive ou en tout cas une bombe silencieuse à mèche courte. Nobody can test it anymore? Well, in fact, they do. The climate deniers are still lying in wait. Mark Morano has also traveled to New York. And he thinks he's a step ahead of his enemies. We've won so many battles. I believe we've won the scientific battle, we've won the public opinion battle, in the sense that polling data says people don't care about global warming, they're not afraid of it. You can come up with polling that says people believe, you know, that humans contribute, but then many skeptical scientists believe the same thing. I don't, I don't think we've lost yet. The activist is not worried about the climate discussions underway, and he's even less worried about those that will take place in Paris in 2015. If the United States is committed to making this happen, not just President Obama, but Secretary of State John Kerry, who's seeking a climate legacy, they will make everything happen. They're going to have the big treaty. They're going to have their big moment in Paris. And it's in the end, it may all just be a bunch of bullshit because it's going to be a bunch of verbal non uh, non compliance emission targets. I want to be Mark Morano is predicting an empty agreement. And on that point, climate change skeptics and ecologists might very well agree. Ça fait 10 ans qu'on entend les mêmes discours et les mêmes choses. Ça va recommencer aujourd'hui et on n'avancera pas parce que notre civilisation est basée sur, sur des échanges, sur le business, sur la croissance. Et tant que notre civilisation sera basée là-dessus, ça ne marchera pas. Donc je ne crois pas à la révolution politique, euh, scientifique, euh, dit même économique. Je pense que ça viendra de, 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 de la base et d'une autre façon. Voilà. Donc je suis là parce que c'est mon monde, c'est le, le monde que j'aime et je suis content de participer à cette marche. Mais voilà, quoi, je, je, je ne... C'est pas, pas ça qui changera le monde. Ça fait tellement longtemps qu'on en parle, ça fait tellement longtemps qu'on voit le rapport du GIEC avec ces, ces chiffres que chaque année augmente, qu'on a l'impression que rien ne change dans nos vies au quotidien. Sincèrement, tu as l'impression que notre vie au quotidien a changé depuis 10 ans, sincèrement. Sous lac sur mer, in the Gironde region. Here, the effects of global warming are already being felt, and rather dramatically. On avait la vue sur l'océan, les États-Unis en face, on voyait pas New York, mais euh, le phare de Cordouan, et puis en face, un palais royant, et toute la côte charentaise. C'était une, une vue assez extraordinaire. The building Le Signal, which has been evacuated as a result of storms and sudden shoreline erosion, is in danger of collapsing. In the late 1960s, it was built 200 meters inland, away from the cliff. At the time, the sea seemed far away. C'est un déchirement et c'est d'une grande tristesse. Mais... Je crois que contre les éléments, c'est difficile de lutter.
The two owners show us one of the evacuated apartments. And now that it's too late, one thing is clear. Les événements arrivent et on a l'air surpris. Alors qu'en fait, c'est annoncé. C'est annoncé. On sait maintenant qu'on est dans une période où le processus, pour moi, il a l'air irréversible. Et irréversible, ça veut dire quelque chose. Irreversible means there is no turning back. Everywhere, all over the world, climate change is underway. The climate change skeptics are a well-identified enemy, but there is another inside each one of us, our resistance to change. And this enemy could be far more dangerous.